Aloha, everyone. Thank you for joining us, joining me and Dr. Lingelbach uh, and I for our second blog holding discussions on learning about the HPU OTD Las Vegas program and ways to strengthen your application. There will be links to my calendar uh, to set up an appointment to discuss our program if you'd like to get a better understanding or guidance to apply. But today's discussion is about observation hours and the importance on the and the benefits to gaining experience around the occupational therapy field. Dr. Lingelbach, how are you today? I hope you're excited for this specific topic as I am. Aloha, Joseph. I'm doing really well. Uh, the sun is shining today. <laughs> it's been a <laughs> yes. good day. I had my morning matcha um, <laughs> already. So yeah, I'm feeling great. Excellent. Well, let's go ahead and get started on today's conversation. Once again, this is going to be observation hours and the importance of it. Uh, one thing I do want to express is I get this all the time in conversations um, with applicants is, are they required or are they recommended? I always like to let them know it is recommended. It's going to be beneficial for them for their future. And I kind of just wanted you to just go into detail on the benefits of these observation hours and how it will help an applicant. Yes, absolutely. So um, I think you brought up such an important point with our application process is that our observation hours for the Las Vegas OTD program are recommended, not required. So I think we should start there. So what does that mean um, in the grand scheme of things? So a requirement means obviously you would have to have that in order to advance to the next stage of us reviewing your application. If it's just recommended, it's something that we'd really like to see on your application. However, um, this is a tricky one because not everybody can get those observation hours in. They might not be able to hit that, you know, 30 hour mark. They may not be able to see two different settings. And so we want to discuss why we would put that recommendation in place in the first place so that if you can't hit that recommendation specifically, you can at least find alternatives that would get you to the same end goal. Excellent. I, I do like that point of alternatives on being able to obtain these observation hours. What ways uh, and alternative ways are they, are students able to accumulate observation hours without going into a facility? Because we know it can be kind of difficult. Right, absolutely. So I think when we talk about alternatives, we're really looking at first the purpose behind the observation hours, which is to allow you the opportunity to see what an occupational therapy practitioner might do in a variety of settings. We are such a big field. We're very holistic. We work with clients across the lifespan and we work in so many different practice settings. So um, I just recently had a friend in the field say, occupation is everywhere. We do occupation everywhere. And so occupational therapy should be everywhere. And we really are moving towards that. So what does that look like? What does OT look like in a school-based setting working with um, kids with disabilities versus what does OT look like in a community mental health um setting um, versus acute care in a hospital. So there's really so much to know, and that's our job in the program is to teach you what those things look like, but we really want you to come in with some foundational knowledge of what occupational therapy can look like in a variety of settings. So how do you do that if you can't get into those settings? I think that's the big question. So um, let me go into a few of those. What we want to see is that you are showing commitment to learning about occupational therapy. You can maybe start a LinkedIn profile and start networking with occupational therapy practitioners that work in a practice setting that's of interest to you. It's That is a, a whole social media platform that is designed for professionals. And so the expectation is that it is okay to extend an invite um, to follow someone or to be connected to someone on a platform like LinkedIn, even if you don't know them yet. So once you establish that connection, you can always, you know, 
um, send them a message and see if they are willing to answer a couple of questions for you. Um, maybe set up a call and, and do an interview so that you can find out what does occupational therapy look like for them in that particular setting. Yeah, no, that's, that's such great information, especially for individuals who may not have all the resources available to them, depending on where they live. I think being able to find alternatives is, is extremely important. And these, these little alternatives are very beneficial in many ways, especially going into a program. And I th that's another topic I kind of also wanted to discuss is the importance of these observation hours going into an OT program and how it helps. Cause I know I explained to students, yes, we want you to get these hours. Yes. We want you to go to different settings, but I, I want to stress to them how important it is, how it's going to not only look good on the application, but it does give them a good understanding where they want to be maybe post-graduation, not just necessarily for the program, but what they can see themselves doing after they graduate. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's great because like we said, we can touch on a lot of this information in the OT program, but the profession is vast. There's no way for any program anywhere to teach you everything that there is to know about the profession. So you really have to go out and get that real world experience to understand what some of those possibilities are. Um, and it really helps you when you're exploring that before the program to start to learn the language of occupational therapy, which will just be an advantage for you as you start your OT program. So here at HPU, we really want to set you up for success from the time you ask us about our program to the time you graduate from our program and start entering into the workforce. So that means we want to make sure that we are asking you to participate in experiences that will help you grow as an occupational therapy practitioner in the future. So that's why we ask. Um, the reason, another reason that I want to bring up why it's not a recommendation is because it's so hard to get those observation hours now. It was always hard before, but when COVID hit, um, new regulations uh, came out and facilities really um, kind of starting to, to tighten up on who they allowed in the doors for just casual shadowing hours. So you may be able to get an opportunity as like a long-term volunteer at a facility and be able to witness um, what occupational therapy might look like in that setting. But those positions are really kind of few and far between. So I think we should talk about a few more alternatives to what those observation hours could look like. So first of all, um, we talked about the LinkedIn profile and maybe just interviewing an occupational therapy practitioner in a setting that's of interest to you. You could also go to um, the American Occupational Therapy Association website and see what their publications are. They put out two major publications um, that are typically of good, uh, high interest for students, including the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, which tends to have more research-based articles. Um, and then we also have OT Practice Magazine. And OT Practice Magazine has a little bit more accessible, special interest pieces about what sort of unique things are happening in the occupational therapy profession around the country. So reading up on occupational therapy in different settings can also start to give you that foundational knowledge. Another suggestion is that there are actually digital shadowing hours out there. So there are a couple of companies out there that have started doing virtual um, synchronous and some asynchronous shadowing hours with an occupational therapy practitioner. Typically those do come at a cost, so they may not be accessible to everyone, but it's at least an option that's out there and they can count towards your shadowing hours. Absolutely. No, that's excellent advice. I also um, did want to bring up, you've mentioned it before in a webinar. Also, we'd like to shout out and say, everyone, we do have webinars once a month. Please reach out to me if you are interested. I can definitely get you signed up. But you've mentioned in a webinar before how going into your undergraduate degree, you didn't have a degree particular leading to occupational therapy. And once you got into those observation hours, what made you really decide that OT was the field you wanted to become passionate with? 
Yeah. I, thanks for, um, for bringing that up. It's, it really is kind of a fun, fun background, but it's certainly not unique per se in occupational therapy, even though we are considered a healthcare discipline and we do have prerequisite courses that include, you know, sciences and things like that. We really do have a foundation in our profession of arts and creativity. And so my background and my undergraduate degree was in theater. Um, I really thought I was going to be an actor someday. <laughs> um, my parents knew better, though. So <laughs> they um, they gently or not so gently made some suggestions uh, as I was getting through my bachelor's degree that I might want to look into a more viable career option. Um, and through the urgings of a couple of different people, I kind of landed on occupational therapy because of that nice balance between um, arts and creativity and science. Um, I'm also a highly empathetic person. And so uh, the ability to go into one of the helping professions just made this like the perfect fit for me. Um, funny story is my parents weren't the, the first ones to suggest occupational therapy. And they actually didn't suggest that specifically. They just gave me a book that had an aptitude <laughs> test in there that pointed me in that direction. But the first person I heard about occupational therapy from was the special education teacher at the high school that I attended. So I was part of the Best Buddies program, um, which is a really wonderful program that pairs typically developing peers with um, someone with a developmental disability. And so our high school had that program um, and I got paired up with actually several um, peers that were in the special education program. And we just had so much fun. I just loved getting to know them. And, um, and they really did become my friends. And our special education teacher said, you know, you would be a great occupational therapist someday. Oh, thanks. That's so wonderful. Filed it back in the back of my brain and did not come back to that for many, many <laughs> years. Um, but the first place that I started shadowing in occupational therapy before school was in a school district, um, which I think was inspired by just kind of seeing what it could look like in that setting. So that was a really fun shadowing experience. <laughs> well, although you you went into the OT field, but the theater still the theater skills still um, look good. I mean, you you, you do well on camera, <laughs> especially during our webinar <laughs> events. You you hold yourself really great. It's so the skills are still there, but it's it's awesome how one little thing could really shift your life. Um, whether it's the aptitude test, that compliment from that teacher. I mean, it's the little things like the little things can make the biggest difference. I completely so, agree. Completely <laughs> agree. Uh, one thing I also did want to ask you is whenever you initially were getting into the program and then you had graduated, were you set on some type of particular setting? And then did it change once you graduated? How did that work for you? Oh, gosh. This is a, a something that comes up a lot. I tend to teach um, first-year students a lot when, when you enter the program. Um, in the last place that I taught, I taught first-year students. I'm going to be teaching first-year students in this program as well, um, which I'm very excited about because I love this field so much, and it's such a such an opportunity to be able to to kind of catch catch you right when you're coming in um, and share the excitement. Um, throughout my program, which was a master's degree, I became really passionate about working with the military. I was set on working in a military setting, whether I joined as an active duty military person myself. Um, or if I was going to be um, a civilian contractor working with active duty military, I really, really was fascinated by that setting. So I was all set to do that. Um, and then it came time for my second level two field work, which was at the end of my program. Um, so at the end of the level two field work, kind of off and running, um, studying for the NBCOT exam and hopefully getting licensed. So I loved my last level two field work, which was in an inpatient rehab hospital. And I learned so much there that I decided once I was licensed, I ended up applying for a position there and I stayed there and kind of let go of the military dream for a while. However, I didn't stay there for very long. Um, I just 
had an inkling that I needed a, a bit of a change um, within my first year of practice. And guess where I ended up? I ended up back in the school system, <laughs> right where it all started. <laughs> and I became a school-based therapist for nine years before I uh, decided to make the switch to academia. Wow. Yeah. That's one thing I've been wanting to ask you just to see how it how like because I we, we we've had our discussions about occupational therapy and a little bit about yourself, but that's one thing I always kind of to always wanted to learn a little bit about you how it all started. But that's really fascinating how you see yourself going in one direction, and one little thing makes the biggest difference. And so I think it's amazing. And now you're helping trying to change lives and set people up with their future. I am. I I thank you. It's I love it. <laughs> I love what I do. Um, it's just such an exciting thing to be able to, uh, you know, teach and train the next generation of occupational therapy practitioners that are going to go out there and and really change the world and the landscape of healthcare um, and en enhance people's well-being in so many different settings. So, um, you know, we have more and more creative ideas for how you can get exposure to all of those different settings. Um, so do feel free to reach out to myself or Joseph um, at any time during the application process. Um, and we're happy to give you some of those suggestions. Absolutely. Now I do have one final question. It's uh, more of a question for advice. I did receive this question this week and I thought it was um, a really Great question just to kind of think about and just give a little bit of advice on how you would put yourself into this position now. The individual asked that they were comfortable in a pediatric setting, but what kind of advice would you give someone who, let's say, aren't very comfortable with the hospital setting, but they're trying to overcome, I wouldn't say this fear, but the uneasiness. They want to go in there to be help, the help out and do their observation hours and potentially go into that field, but what kind of advice would you give somebody who may not be comfortable with the specific kind of setting? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and, and honestly, not that unusual um, because occupational therapy has so many different areas um, that you can work in. I would say really don't, um, don't push yourself to be in a space that isn't going to make you thrive. Um, there is space for everyone in our field, um, in my opinion. That's that's one of the reasons I joined HPU um, and do admissions is to increase access um, to this field to lots of different people of, of different abilities, um, different strengths. So, you know, maybe your strength won't be in that very traditional medical setting, and that is okay. That still means that you have a place in occupational therapy. Um, you might want to just start with something else or maybe start with a little exposure therapy. If you don't want to walk into a hospital building, maybe just watch a YouTube video about what occupational therapy looks like in a hospital-based setting. So you still get that understanding without having to put yourself in that uncomfortable position. That being said, you may encounter um, some of your fieldwork experiences within a hospital-based setting, but that's something that you just want to disclose to us up front so that we know what the best fit for you will be. Excellent answer. Yeah, no, that you said it way better than what I, the way I did, but the way I told them is just, look, we want you to be comfortable and similar to, like you said, we want you to thrive. We want you to be comfortable where you're at, to be able to stay passionate and just grow. Yes. It's not a requirement to work in a hospital as an <laughs> occupational therapist. So <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to be there if you don't want to be there. Um, there's, there's lots of other opportunities for you out there. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the time. Everyone who watched our video, thank you so much. We're going to be trying to put these up as much as possible just so we can be able to give you some insight information and also make this really personal. We want to just have these little monthly conversations to be a good resource for you. Please check us out on the school website. If you haven't gotten my email or my Calendly link to set up an appointment, we will have those links at the bottom. But thank you very much for your time, Dr. Lingelbach. Thank you very much for another excellent conversation. Appreciate it. Mahalo. Mahalo, everybody.